Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me just check my slide is working. Yeah, okay. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, to be able to address you today uh, alongside Professor Steve Keane. I am part of the Australian contingent of the Polish Economics Network. And my first controversial suggestion for this talk, and there will be others, is that we hold the second regeneration conference in Sydney on the beach. Uh, we could have Professor. Professor Keane on the barbecue, we could go swimming, uh, and we could start the Polish Economist Down Under. So I think that's a great idea. So I'm a political scientist uh, at the University of Exeter in the UK, and I'm also head of research at a think tank called Autonomy. Uh, at Autonomy, we're leading campaigns to promote a shorter working week, universal basic income, and support for digital cooperatives. So my, in my work, I write reports on the digital economy, and I also work alongside cooperative businesses to help them scale and to grow. So my presentation today concerns how we can reorganize the digital economy along cooperative lines. It's an argument for democratic control and governance in the, cooperative, uh, in the digital sector, and I want us to think about how we can reimagine the internet. So let's start uh, by, by looking at some of the problems with how we're going. Now, if Elon Musk uh, succeeds in buying Twitter, we're going to have two men with a real dominating interest in the vast majority uh, of our global communication infrastructure. This is a big issue. Now, big tech has shown us that it has these enormous world-building ambitions. They don't want to be just an option that you choose. They want to be the very space within which a choice is made available to you. As big tech continues its ambition to grow and to own the infrastructure upon which we live our daily lives, um, we can see that we're getting more and more monopolies, greater gatekeeping power, uh, and a lack of control for communities in how their digital lives are organized. Now, I've recently written a book um, about breaking up um, big tech, and the, what the motivation for writing this book was really looking at what was the major criticisms that we had of the tech sector, um, and how did they structure public debate? I think the main thing we hear about over and over again is this humanist critique. We should log off social media, big tech is controlling our autonomy, um, now, this doesn't deal with the underlying problems with the political economy of the tech sector. We also hear a lot about breaking up big tech, right? This antitrust, anti-monopoly agenda. Um, now, here, I think this is moving in the right direction, right? Big tech clearly is too big and too powerful. But I think it misses one of the primary problems, which is the for-profit nature of the digital economy. If we were to break up Facebook or one of these other large tech conglomerates into several smaller companies like was done with the oil or the telecommunications infrastructure in the US, what would stop them from operating according to the exact same principles? Why in, in an open data market where tech companies are rewarded uh, for harvesting as much data as possible, for expanding their consumer base, for trying to create and keep people on their platforms, um, why would these companies operate in any different manner to the larger ones? Um, so I think this is an important, um, important problem. In my book, I suggest that we start to move away from questions of, of privacy, um, of uh, pr you know, uh, private proprietary rights over data, um, and this fascination with the size of companies, to start talking about some of the underlying problems with power, with ownership and control, because it's here that the real problems lie. In my um, understanding of how digital platforms operate, I think we really need to start looking at the notion that platforms are primarily value capture devices. They are designed and they're built to capture the value creating activity of others. I think we've heard a lot about innovation as this abstract category that is you know, an undeniable good. But we need to start talking about what effects and what outcomes do these processes of innovation produce? What kinds of systems does innovation create? Who controls them? Who has power here? What is it doing to our sense of our self-control and self-determination? What interests do these systems serve? 
And I want to address this question of innovation in the tech sector. And I would start by saying, what, what innovation? You have 10 new iPhones, but we have no sense of, you know, genuine solutions to some of the ecological challenges we're facing. Um, Mega, uh, sorry, Meta's biggest policy, Meta, the, the, the new name for Facebook, uh, is the metaverse, a, a rebrand of a failed 1990s technology of virtual reality, which was rejected by consumers as, as both unhelpful and unpopular. I think it's worth remembering that the true innovation that we've seen in digital technology was in the 20th century, and it was through public investment in open research, things like the internet, computers, GPS, all of these things were the result of public investment in research, public investment in development. We didn't need Mazzucato to for us to, 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 to know that. Mark Zuckerberg did not invent digital communities. He wrote some code at a time when the idea had come to its realization. People were doing that all over the world. Digital platforms capture the value created by others. Um, and they're able to charge rentier relations on that, which leads to a process of a few billionaires concentrating profits while they s seek to disperse risk and responsibility onto vulnerable workers, onto the global south. Um, so this is a big problem, and I think the solution lies in innovative forms of social ownership where communities, big and small, both local, national, sometimes international, can start to have more ownership and control over how platforms operate. In my book, I suggest that we can start to explore not simple binary models of commons public or of state-owned and private-owned, but we can start to open up a more sophisticated and a more complex discussion about how different types of communities can exercise control over different digital platforms. At the local level, we can think of many geographically based businesses, things like cleaning services, food delivery, um, uh, freelance work, where we can imagine, and we, we already have many examples of platform cooperatives that are going to be able to undertake these services. We don't need everything to be a global blitz scale brand that's gonna do the same thing everywhere, right? We need to think positively about this notion of community wealth building, of keeping um, local economies functioning and of not having profits dispersing off to global multinational companies. But I think we need to go further still because the, the kinds of research that we're, we've now doing into the cooperative economy is showing that it needs to, be, to foster and to, to be cultivated within ecosystems of friendly municipal institutions, of adequate support in the legal and regulatory domain, uh, and appropriate sources of funding. Um, and, and, and technical and educational support. So I think this idea of a municipal level of digital platforms and of pl uh, support for cooperatives is really important. And I would point you to some really n interesting new work uh, that's being done on public commons partnerships. This is instances where we have public institutions, things like municipal authorities or local or state government, that is stepping in to support the development uh, and the uh, flourishing of the cooperative sector. Now, I think we can push this right up to the national uh, and international levels. Things like digital social networks, um, public search engines, these can't be done at the local level. I think we need to be able to expand our imagination to start thinking about what would democratic governance look like at an international level? How would we, how would we manage that? How would a company like Twitter, um, if it was a kind of public or, or community-owned institution, how would we start to organize things like moderation policies, design of new features and services? I think this is essential, and we now have the tools to be able to do this. It's simply not the case that we all need to be in one room, from software like Decidium that's used in Barcelona um, to other participatory fora we can, we can have these debates, we can start to have these deliberations, people can vote on these. There are problems there, there not all the issues have been worked out, but this is the conversation we need to start having. 
uh, one example, and I'll just take you through a few practical examples now. One example is a food delivery platform, an alternative to, there's an Easter egg here for anyone who's looking at the photos. Uh, so a, a, a local personality who you either love or loathe. Um, but <laughs> next, next, to, next to that gentleman is a, a, a young man that I've been working with, Rich Mason, uh, and his cooperative that he's been uh, working, which is an alternative to Uber Eats, right? If you're in London where I live and I work, um, you can call up Wings uh, and you can have a cooperatively run business um, deliver food from, from local restaurants. We can also turn to other examples at a slightly larger scale. Men, some of you might be aware of uh, fairbnb.coop, a cooperative alternative to Airbnb where in many destinations around Europe you can look and uh, book a host and here we see a real transformation of how the digital economy could be organised. Uh, instead of turning housing into an asset, right, and turning a, a whole host of, of middle-class uh, uh, professionals uh, into, you know, micro-entrepreneurs, suddenly we see a rule of one host, one house. Uh, it removes this speculative element that turns housing from a human right into a, an asset to be commodified. And it says... You can, you know, you can rent your house out for short periods under certain conditions, um, but it can't become this speculative asset market that it has become with Airbnb, which is really at this stage just facilitating a series of other businesses um, commodifying housing. Um, in addition, we can turn to um, really fascinating uh, projects and, and prototypes at the European level. Uh, such as the EU-funded Decode project or the, its previous um, iteration, uh, Descent. Now here we can look at the work of Francesca Bria um, and s some of her team, thinking about how we can start to create a, a public digital infrastructure, tech platforms that are actually in control uh, or, or rather controlled by municipal institutions, which start to facilitate the creation of data commons, f small cooperative ecosystems that you know, are participatory, have uh, citizen input, um, and in the decode example, they start to help public authorities solve problems, things like air pollution, noise pollution, mobility problems around a city. Now, at the moment, these are only small prototypes, and I don't want to exaggerate the kind of advances that we have. What I'm suggesting is that we can begin to see a different way of doing things, that you do have this pathway of, of huge monopolies, of, of billions being privatized and siloed in, in tiny bank accounts, but we have other options. We have prototypes and what we need to do is start to seriously examine what supporting these cooperative prototypes would look like in practice. Um, I'm going to skip that idea. That's like a fanciful idea that I have for a, 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 like an alternative to Uber in London, which is publicly owned. Now, on the international level, um, we can also see that there are other possibilities for social media. Now, social media is inherently international, right? What use would be a social network if we could only talk to friends and comrades uh, in Poland or in the UK? We want cross-fertilization. I've learned so much from being here today. I don't want to be in a UK-only social network, God forbid. Um, so... W but w within the social network space, within social media, we also have uh, examples of community ownership uh, and alternatives to some of the major corporate platforms. Um, within the inherent affordances of the technology, um, we have natural tendencies towards federalism. So you can turn to examples like Mastodon for an alternative to Twitter. Um, on services like Mastodon, you can communicate with others in, in small nodes, but also be part of larger conversations. Now, what this does is it turns our social media experience from one giant cacophony of voices into people that nest in small communities that start to have more autonomy over the rules um, that they create, so what kind of moderation policies they have, who is in the network. Um, but the fact that these um, are interoperable services allows you, much like an email service, to exchange and communicate with people in different nodes of the network. Um, now, at the level of uh, something like a digital, um, uh, sorry, an internet search engine, 
I think here we just need basically one example, right? We, we only need a single search engine. So I think in rather than having a federation of, of uh, alternatives, it's really about thinking about how we can get something like Google under public control, right? Under some kind of foundation um, that would help manage this in the same way that we have Wikipedia um, to, to manage some of the world's knowledge, I think we need a search engine to be organized uh, along similar grounds. Now, before I conclude, I'm not really paying attention to you. I don't have time. I've got I've two minutes of free speech. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I couldn't not mention is this uh, problem of digital colonialism. Um, because I think so much when we're talking about innovation and digital technology, we ignore the fact that so much of this economy is completely founded upon an extremely extractive relationship between the global north and the global south. And unless we foreground this and treat this as a primary problem, we can't talk about innovation, right? We can't talk about this because it's founded on this, you know, utterly primary uh, injustice that's occurring around the world. So I think we need cooperative control of the economy and we need this uh, to be done in light of some of the issues around digital colonialism today. So thank you very much.